if we can start. Um, welcome uh, to this uh, webinar about the use of uh, BRB for the uh, seismic upgrading of existing reinforced concrete structures. This webinar is organized by the FIB Italy Young Members Group. And if you want to learn more about that, our activities, you can connect with us on our social channels or um, with our, uh, you can consult our uh, webpage. And uh, the speaker of today is uh, Francesca Barbagallo. Francesca is an assistant professor at the University of Catania in Italy. And she's an expert in uh, um, retrofit of existing uh, reinforced concrete structures with um, these innovative techniques. And she's working on development of design procedures for these, uh, the use of these theoretical devices for the seismic upgrading of uh, existing uh, reinforced concrete structures. So thank you, Francesca, for being here today with us. And please, you can start sharing your screen. So good afternoon, everyone. Can I share my video? Yes. OK. OK. OK, can you see my presentation? I hope so. So um, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you, Marta, for the presentation. And thank you to the FIB Italy Young Members Group for inviting me to hold this webinar. Uh, my presentation will deal with the seismic upgrading of existing RC frame by introducing buckling restraining braces. And it, de it develops uh, into seven points. So I will start from briefly uh, explaining the motivation that are behind uh, doing research on seismic upgrading. And uh, I'll uh, explain uh, the technique that we propose for seismic retrofit uh, of uh, reinforcing concrete frames. Um, then I'll show you the design method that we developed and we propose, and also how we design the case study frames that we used for the following numerical calibration of the design procedure. Then I'll show you also the experimental validation of this design method. And in the end, I will draw some conclusions or possible further applications. Before uh, going straight to the point, please let me introduce you the research team that's behind this research. It's the research team of University of Catania, led by Professor Eduardo Marino. And in addition to me, the um, other colleagues that are involved are also Professor Bosco, Professor Rossi, Dr. Stramondo. And we also have to thank some of our master students for their help, particularly Aldo Murgano and Federico Grassi. So going into uh, deep the presentation, um, we should answer, uh, since the beginning, we should answer to a question, why do we do research on seismic upgrading and why existing RC buildings need to be upgraded? So to answer this question, uh, I would like to provide you with some data regarding the Italian building stock. From the point of view of the Euro construction, more than 50% of the Italian buildings were designed before 1975, and more than 90% were designed before 2003. From the point of view of the type of construction, uh, one fourth of the Italian building stock is composed of uh, RC framed buildings. In addition, we should also consider the seismic hazard map of Italy. This is the current uh, seismic zonation of Italy, but we know that uh, uh, it developed through the years and it's quite different from the beginning. In fact, this is the seismic hazard map of 1975, and uh, you can easily note that many areas that today are classified as seismic prone areas high seismicity areas uh, in the past uh, were considered as non-seismic prone areas. And I just focus it on Sicily because I work a bit here, but you can extend the same observation to the majority of the Italian territory. So if we, we cross all this information, um, we can draw some important um, in conclusion. First of all, if until 1975, most of Italy was classified as non-seismic area, this means that more than 50% of the buildings that are in use today were designed for gravity loads only. Furthermore, if only in 2003, Italy was declared as seismic prone almost everywhere, 
and the very first effective seismic code uh, entered into force. This means that more than 90% of the buildings do not comply with the current seismic code. So basically the um, building stock, uh, the Italian building stock, it's composed by frames designed for gravity loads or frames designed according to obsolete seismic codes. And uh, you can extend this uh, um, observation also to the other Mediterranean countries. Uh, the first type of buildings are characterized by resisting elements and mainly orientated in one direction, a low dissipative collapse mechanism or uh, low ductility members and poor quality materials. While the other type of buildings uh, do not comply with the current uh, capacity design criteria and uh, uh, cannot sustain the required seismic excitation of the current zonation. So basically, uh, we have a problem because all these frame, all these frames, all these buildings cannot sustain uh, the expected earthquake today. So what can we do? Uh, should we demolish it and reconstruct everything? Of course, it's not possible because uh, it's expensive and uh, the majority of these buildings are still in use. So we need to upgrade them. And upgrading is also important from an environmental point of view because um, we should know that the European construction and demolition waste is about 33% of the total amount of waste. So this means that if we have a collapse or if we should um, restore an entire buildings, uh, the amount of waste that's produced would increase deeply. So to solve this problem, so to uh, upgrade existing um, RC frames, we propose a special intervention. Typically, existing RC frame uh, need to uh, have additional lateral stiffness and strength and uh, need to have a higher energy dissipation capacity and to prevent the concentration of damage, so to avoid the soft story collapse mechanism. To solve these issues, we propose the insertion of buckling restraining braces inside the RC frame. So what is a BRB, a buckling restraining braces, and why uh, did we select it for the retrofit? First of all, the BRB is a special brace that's composed by an inner part devoted to sustain the axial force that's inserted inside, inside uh, an outer casing. The outer casing um, is uh, uh, needed to prevent buckling. The inner part is composed by an unrestrained and non-yielding segment that's usually the part uh, used for the connection, a yielding core, and a transition elastic segment. The yielding core is the part of the brace that's devoted to yield. When the inner part is inserted inside the casing, the casing is infilled with mortar and the inner part is covered by an unbonding film, at least in the unbonded braces. And the cross sections of the uh, core could be different. These are some uh, examples and these pictures is quite popular in scientific literature. Um, but what is the response that is provided by the BRP? So to show, uh, to explain the cyclic response of a brace, I would like to use the results of uh, an experimental test that you can easily find on the internet. So here you can see a typical unbonded BRB um, subjected to axial force. And on the left side, you can see the cyclic response. So if we look at a simplified version of that cyclic response, we can immediately note uh, two important features. First of all, it doesn't uh, show any buckling and it has an excellent inelastic behavior. In fact, thanks to the outer casing, uh, the buckling in compression is prevented and the brace can heal both in tension and compression, uh, thus having a very uh, regular cyclic response. The inelastic behavior is very good because it shows a high ductility capacity and the cyclic response is stable and very dissipative. So if we compare the BRP to the conventional uh, brace, what is the advantages? Let's have a look to a conventional brace. Uh, here there's another uh, test that you can easily find again on the internet. 
Uh, here, the conventional brace is loaded axially, and you can note from the cyclic response, but also looking at the brace, that it suffers from buckling in compression. And you can also appreciate the um, plastic hinges that is going to form in the, in the middle. So again, if we analyze the uh, cyclic response of the conventional brace, then you can note that it suffers from buckling. So this means that it can yield only in tension. And the cyclic response become quite irregular and uh, it has a low dissipative capacity. So uh, another important advantage that's provided by uh, BRB uh, is that this type of uh, braces are already uh, widely available in the market. And I just show you here some examples produced by different uh, industries all over the world. Furthermore, PRP are well studied in scientific literature. You can find it in a lot of papers uh, regarding all the details of BRP, and this means that the features and, of course, the limitations of these devices are already well known. So, um, thanks to uh, these advantages that are provided by the BRP, we tried to exploit all of them and to uh, propose to develop a design method for seismic upgrading of existing RC frame introducing buckling restraining braces. This method is uh, based on a direct control of solid drift. Uh, it aims to be consistent with Eurocode requirements and uh, um, it aims to have a multi-performance based perspective. The design uh, method is based on two requirements. The first one is a drift requirement. The second one is a ductility requirement on the braces. The drift requirement um, aims to have the drift demand lower than the design story drift at all stories. So, uh, thanks to this requirement, we can determine the axial stiffness of the brace. Uh, the second requirement instead aims to have uh, to keep the ductility demand of the PRP lower than the ductility capacity. And uh, this requirement uh, leads to, leads to uh, the determination of the yield axial strength of the braces. So now I will go into the details of the two requirements. And we should keep in mind that for both of them, we need a demand and a capacity. Let's start from the drift requirement. And uh, in particular, we start from uh, evaluating the design story drift. To this end, we need to set a target limit state, um, for example, the near collapse limit state, and we evaluate the design, uh, the drift capacity delta and s as the product of the ultimate chord rotation uh, corresponding to the target limit state times the clear interstory height. Uh, the ultimate chord rotation is calculated according to the formulation proposed by Panagiotakos and Fargis and provided by Eurocode 8. And we know that this formulation is uh, rather complicated because it involves uh, um, a lot of parameters. Um, in particular, it depends from the features of the cross section, the material properties, but especially on the um, amount of axial force acting on the cross section. So we conduct a pushover analysis and we push the structure until it attains uh, the drift capacity. And we evaluate in the meantime the corresponding lateral strength. But be careful because our design story drift is not necessarily equal to the drift capacity. In fact, we suppose to have a design story drift that's equal to a percentage of the capacity delta LS. This percentage, this reduction is uh, um, indicated by the factor beta that's uh, uh, lower or equal than one. And uh, I will give you some further details on which value of beta should be used. Uh, I will give you later. So once that we uh, determine the uh, design story drift, uh, we should determine the drift, uh, the, demand, the, the demanded uh, story drift. So uh, to, um, to this end, we run an elastic analysis uh, considering an unreduced elastic spectrum for the assumed limit state, and we evaluate the elastic drift. 
actually uh, the elastic drift should be um, corrected because uh, it should account for an important issue. We are using an elastic analysis. So this means that the axial forces that are transmitted uh, by BRPS are actually smaller than those predicted by the elastic analysis because uh, the braces yield. So to account for this issue, we considered the RC frame with BRBs as two systems in parallel, the bare RC frame and the truss frame with the braces. The truss frame has a drift that's assumed to be equal to the elastic drift given by the elastic analysis. The, um, the drift of the truss frame is actually due to the contribution of the brace, uh, so the contribution to the story drift due to the PRB deformation, but it also due to uh, the contribution uh, of the column due to the column deformation. In particular, we have to pay attention to the actual uh, contribution due to the column deformation because uh, this value, delta C, that's obtained by the elastic analysis should be reduced by the force reduction factor that's equal to the base shear evaluated by the elastic analysis divided by the actual lateral resistance evaluated by the pushover analysis that we ran before. So by doing some uh, simple mathematical steps, we can correct the elastic drift to evaluate the actual drift demand delta. So we uh, saw how uh, to determine the uh, design soil drift and the drift demand. So we have to compare uh, them at each story. The question is, is uh, uh, the drift demand larger than the design story drift? If no, we are happy because means, it means that uh, we don't need to have the uh, stiffness. We don't need to upgrade. But usually the uh, drift demand is larger than the design story drift in our uh, existing frames. So this means that an additional stiffness must be provided by the truss frame. The required stiffness that has to be provided by the truss frame is uh, uh, the difference between the total required stiffness obtained from the elastic analysis and the stiffness already provided by the bare frame. But we have to pay attention to the required stiffness of the truss frame because we are interested in the stiffness that has to be provided by the braces. So at the first iteration, we, uh, we have to say that this part of the design procedure is iterative. So if we are at the first iteration, then these two quantities are the same. But from the second iteration on, uh, these two quantities are not equal. And actually, the additional stiffness that has to be provided by the braces should be evaluated as the story shear carried by the braces divided by the contribution to the story drift, uh, delta B, due to the axial deformation of the braces. From the previous observation, we can see that the uh, delta B uh, is, uh, can be obtained as the difference of the total drift due to the shear carried by the braces and uh, the drift due to column axial deformation. So once that we evaluate the additional stiffness that has to be provided by the braces, knowing how many MB, how many braces um, can we insert in the frame and the geometrical features, we can um, determine the axial stiffness that has to be provided by the single brace. And um, afterwards, we can immediately evaluate the area of the cross section. So, so far we concluded the drift requirement and we determined the cross section of the braces. But we have another requirement, uh, requirement that has to be fulfilled, that's the ductility requirement. Again, we have a capacity of the brace that's provided by the manufacturer and the ductility demand. The ductility demand of the brace um, is evaluated as the ratio of the story drift due to the PRP deformation corresponding to the attainment of the drift capacity and the story drift due to the PRP deformation corresponding to the PRP yielding. So if we equate 
the capacity and the demand. And we express delta by as a function of the uh, axial stiffness um, calculated before, we can determine the yielding axial strength of the brace. Um, so probably so far, uh, I gave you many details and the design procedure could appear to be a little bit messy. So we have to put all the steps in order. And to do this, um, I used a flow chart. So here are the two requirements, the drift and the ductility requirements that we have already described. The procedure starts from the drift requirement by running the pushover analysis to evaluate the lateral strength, the uh, drift capacity and the drift demand. Then we conduct the linear elastic analysis to evaluate the elastic drift drift, and we correct it to obtain the actual drift demand delta. Then we have to compare the drift demand to the design story drift at all story. If uh, the demand is larger than the design story drift, this means that we have to add stiffness by introducing the braces. But if we introduce the braces, the elastic drift changes, so we have to run again the elastic analysis correct again to obtain the actual drift demand and compare again the demand in the capacity. This iterative part of the procedure keep on repeating until at all story, the drift demand is equal or lower than the design story drift. If so, uh, we can shift to the second requirement, evaluate delta max and delta y and determine the yielding axial strength. So we determine all the features of the braces, but probably at the very first, uh, um, at the very first iterations, the BRBS that you define are different from those of the um, previous uh, uh, iteration. And if you are at the first, of course, they are different because you didn't have any braces before. So if we, intro if we introduce a BRB that's different from the previous iteration, this means that the axial force that it transmits to the columns changes and the capacity ch will change in turn. So we need to start again the design procedure to satisfy the drift requirement, and then again to satisfy as well the ductility requirement. If at the end, the features of the new BRBS, this new um, step uh, did not change compared to the features of the previous uh, iteration, this means that the design procedure attain the convergence and it ended. So to calibrate this design method, we needed uh, a set of case study frames. So we designed three RC frames that are uh, actually drawn from two buildings. On the left side, we have the seismic resistance building. On the right side, the gravity load building. Both of them are six story high, located in high seismicity region and suffer from different levels of seismic deficiency. So they uh, aim to be representative of a variety of existing buildings. The analyzed frames are the outermost frames uh, on the right side directed along the Y direction. Uh, in particular, the SR frame, that's the seismic resistant frame, was designed according to the old Italian seismic code for low seismicity area. So the seismic forces were evaluated by the lateral force method and uh, the capacity design was not explicitly applied. And in particular, we suppose that the uh, concrete compressive strength uh, in use is actually lower than that assumed in design. As for frame GL1 and GL2, both of them are drawn from the same building that was designed according to old Italian seismic code of the 90s, 1970s. Um, so it was designed for gravity loads only. In fact, you can see that the cross section of columns reduces along the height, and the beam lacks, and the building lacks of beam along the y direction. That's the weak direction. Frame GL1 and GL2 differ for the um, features of the material. In fact, frame GL2 was assumed to have an actual concrete compressive strength lower than that used in design. To assess the seismic response of these buildings, uh, we need to develop a numerical model. So we develop a plane frame model in OpenSys, where columns and beams uh, were uh, modeled as beam within these elements. So we have a central elastic part 
And at the end, we have plastic hinges that are assigned with the fiber cross section. Uh, single fibers um, are introduced to simulate the reinforcement and they are assigned with an elastoplastic hardening um, material for simulating the steel. As for concrete, we use the demander uh, concrete law. And uh, in particular for frame SR, we distinguish the properties of the core from those of the, con of the cover because we assume that uh, uh, in a seismic resistant frame, even though a old seismic resistant frame, we should have a good amount of steroids, so uh, they should provide, which should provide a uh, good confinement on the core. Instead, for frame GL, we assume the same properties for cover and core, uh, because uh, we assume to have very poor steroids, so almost no confinement on the core. Uh, P-delta effects were considered adding a leaning column element at the end, and we simulated the implant stiffness of the concrete slab by introducing a rigid diaphragm. Uh, on this topic, I should also add that we introduced an additional element to solve a bug that we um, faced. In fact, uh, the interaction between the rigid diaphragm and the fiber cross section um, caused the development of unexpected axial forces in beams. So to avoid this, we introduce it at one end of each beam, a buffer element. This is a zero length element that's uh, characterized by low axial stiffness. So it acts as an axial uh, release, but it restores in the meantime, the continuity of the node, uh, thanks to its high shear and flexural, flexural stiffness. Um, how we determine the response of the case study? We use the incremental nonlinear dynamic analysis, uh, applying 10 artificial accelerograms compatible with elastic response spectrum for soil type C. And for each PGA and for each accelerogram, we evaluated the maximum soil drift angle and the mm, demand to capacity ratio in terms of story drift for significant damage and near collapse lane state. For each PGA, the median value over the 10 accelerograms was assumed as an index of performance and the PGA capacity was assumed equal to 0.45 G. So here I start to show the response of the case study frames, particularly frame SR in terms of story drift angle along the height for increasing value of PGAs. Uh, white dots uh, pinpoint the result for 0.05G, then we have 0.15, 25, 35, and 45G. And you can see that the story drift angle of frame SR is rather uniform along the height. But the same conclusion cannot be said also for frame GL1 and GL2, because both of them suffered from a drift concentration at the fourth story. And also they presented several numerical instabilities that are index of incipient collapse. So uh, in terms of drift demand to capacity ratio, uh, here are the results for all frames and for all the PGAs at the near collapse limit state. Uh, the near collapse limit state would be satisfied if the demand is lower than the capacity. So this means the ratio delta over delta less should be lower than one for, for PGA 0.45G. Actually, you can see here that all frames exceeded the near collapse limit state, so the ratio exceeded the unity for PGAs lower than 0.45G. In the game, even if we check the significant damage limit state, all the frames um, did not uh, fulfill the significant damage limit state because the drift demand to capacity ratio exceeded the unity for PGAs lower than 0.35G. So this means that all our case study needed to be upgraded. So we applied it our design procedure and we assumed the near collapse limit say the target, so a PGA of 0.45 G. The ductility of the braces was, took equal to, was taken equal to uh, 25 and the solid drift capacity was evaluated at the near collapse limit state. We should uh, now answer to previous question, uh, which value should be used for beta? 
because beta determines the design, so a drift delta D. To calibrate the most proper value, we design three times the retrofit of the frames, assuming beta equal to 1, 0 0.8, and 0 .0 0 0.6. And uh, the lower was uh, beta, uh, the stiffer and stronger were PRPs because the drift requirement uh, became more restrictive and it needed larger and stronger braces. So uh, to run the numerical calibration, uh, the seismic response of the upgraded frames uh, was evaluated by nonlinear dynamic analysis. So again, we use uh, the same accelerograms uh, already uh, used for the bare frames, scaled at PGA 0.45G. And uh, the response was assessed comparing the demand to capacity in terms of uh, drift and uh, BRB ductility. The value of the design story drift that led to a demand to capacity ratio not larger than one was then suggested as the most proper value for the design. Of course, in this analysis, we had to introduce into the numerical model of the RC frame, the braces. So uh, here I'll show you the response of frame SR in terms of demand to capacity ratio. Uh, of the uh, story drift. And the black dots show the results, so the response of the bear SR frame at the 0.45 G. If we upgrade, so if we insert the braces using a design story drift equal to the capacity, the ratio uh, becomes lower at all stories, but actually it does not improve so much. Better performance is obtained if we use a design story drift equal to 80% of capacity, but the best result is obtained if the design story drift is equal to 60% of capacity. And again, if we look at the same um, response, but for frame GL1 and GL2, and we focus on the uh, response of the retrofitted frames designed by design story drift equal to 60% of capacity, we can note that all of them fulfill the verification on story drift. From the point of view of the ductility of the BRP, again, we compare the demand to capacity and all frames designed with the delta D equal to 60% of capacity fulfill the verification also on the ductility requirement. So this means that the value of design story drift equal to 60% of capacity led all frames, uh, led to frames that were safe in terms of story drift and BRP ductility at the near collapse limit state. That was the target limit state. But what about significant damage limit state? That was not the performance objective of our design. We wanted to check it again. So to this end, we had to reduce the ductility capacity of the braces to 19 and also uh, the drift capacity because it had to be evaluated at the significant damage limit state. Of course, we also scaled the, P the PGA of the accelerograms to 0.35G. I show you again the results for um, in terms of story drift and VRB ductility for all the frames. And if you focus again on the seismic response of the frames that were retrofitted, assuming a design story drift equal to 60% of capacity, all the verification of story drift and ductility were satisfied. So this means that the most proper value that should be used uh, for the design uh, is a, a design story drift equal to 60% of the capacity, because this uh, value leads to frames that are able to uh, fulfill the near collapse, but also the significant damage limit state. Um, afterwards, we also decided to validate uh, experimentally the design procedure, the calibrated design procedure. Uh, this part of the research is the result of a collaboration between the University of Catania and the Harbin Institute of Engineering uh, Mechanics in China. The goal of this research comes from, uh, stems from observing, first of all, which is the usual roadmap uh, that's followed to develop a new seismic protection technique. 
Uh, this word map uh, starts from develop the development of a device that's tested at phys uh, physically at a uh, component level. Then it's introduced into the structure and the design method is uh, developed or calibrated. And the first um, step is experimental, but the other two are numerical. Um, so this research wanted to add a fourth step because um, um, this research wanted to make it clear if the expectations from the numerical um, part of the roadmap meet the reality. So it introduced an experimental verification of the technique, but also of the design procedure by means of a physical test at a structural level. To this end, um, the test was uh, uh, conducted using the substructure hybrid test. Uh, this test um, requires, if we, we have an entire structure, and here, just for example, I show you a base isolated structure, uh, the hybrid test requires the structure decomposition into a numerical substructure and an experimental substructure. This latter is selected as the most interesting part of the structure to be tested physically. We also have a simplified numerical model, and that's a dynamic model. So from the two substructures, the refined numerical substructure and the experimental substructure, we provide the restoring forces to the numerical model. This one uh, solves the uh, equation of motions and provide the target displacement that has to be assigned for the next step to the two substructures. Uh, why using number an hybrid test instead of conventional test? First of all, because the hybrid test involves the physical test of just a portion of the structure, but it remains a full-scale test. Restoring forces are not based just on the numerical analysis, but they are provided by experimental tests. And the dynamic input is simulated by an intermittent quasi-static test. In our case, we decide to test our design procedure by um, testing frame GL1. So we decompose it into the numerical and the experimental substructure. And we also have our simplified 60 degrees of freedom model. Two specimens were tested, the bare frame and the upgraded frame with the braces that were also cyclically uh, tested. And the ground motion that was used as input was drawn from the set of accelerograms used in the previous analysis and was scaled for PGA 0.10, 20, 35, and 45G. So to investigate the effectiveness of the uh, upgrading by RC by buckling with training braces, we first of all uh, had a look at the cracks that formed. Here you have the cracks on the bare frame and on the retrofitted frame. Uh, basically, the crack mapping is similar or less severe in the retrofitted frame than in the bare frame. Uh, the major cracks concentrate at the member ends are denser in the right column, that's the cipher column. Uh, major damage occurred at the base of the column of the bare frame, but we also uh, pay attention to the cracks that concentrate in the node, in the beam to column node, due to the um, axial force, the concentrated force that's transmitted by the braces. So a very important role is played by the connection between braces and the RC frame that has to be designed to avoid buckling and uh, yielding. But I want you to focus on an important detail. Uh, these two uh, crack mapping seem to be very similar, but be careful because the fat of the pair frame is attained at 0.35G, while that of the RC frame with the braces is obtained at 0.45 g. So this means that the insertion of the braces reduced or delayed to larger PGAs the formation of cracks. We also checked the hysteretic loops and compared that of the original frame in black to that of the retrofitted frame in red. At the 0.10 g, basically both structures were um, elastic, so we compare the initial elastic stiffness of the bare frame 
and that of the retrofitted frame. And the, that of the retrofitted frame, of course, was about uh, was larger, and it was about then uh, twice um, that of the pair frame. Of 0 0.20 and 35G, the structure behaved in both of them, uh, behaved in the inelastic range of behavior. But we have to note that um, the cyclic response of the retrofitted frame was better because uh, the services loops were larger and uh, uh, they attain also a larger maximum shear force. At 0.45G, uh, we had only the retrofitted, the retrofitted frame and it showed a very stable fat hysteretic cycle with no, almost no degradation of stiffness and strength. Uh, to um, evaluate the effectiveness of the upgrading intervention, we also conducted an energy analysis. So here you can see the total dissipated energy by the RC frame for increasing PGA and um, that dissipated by the retrofitted frame in green. For PGAs larger than 0 0.10, of course, the retrofitted frame dissipated more energy than the bare frame. But this doesn't mean that the RC members were aggravated. In fact, we evaluated the, dissipate, the energy dissipated by only RC members. Uh, here in gray, you see the energy dissipated by the members of the bare frame, and in green, again, that dissipated by the, mem the RC members of the retrofitted configuration. As you can see, for all PGAs, the members of, of the retrofitted frame dissipate a lower amount of energy, so are less damaged than those of the bare frame. And if you look at 0.45G, the RC members dissipate a slightly larger amount of energy compared to the same members of the bare frame at lower PGA 0.35G. This was a consequence of the fact that the BRP dissipated almost 50% of the total input energy for almost uh, all, for all the intensity ground motions. So the, the insertion of the braces was able to increase the energy dissipation capacity. And in the meantime, it relieved the RC members dissipative task. We also checked our, the global response of our GL1 frame and compared the response of the original frame, which suffers from damage uh, drift concentration, damage concentration at the fourth story, that is uh, um, in accordance with what we found in the numerical analysis. And we compare this response to that of the retrofitted frame in red. Of course, the retrofitted frame gained from the benefits of the introduction of the braces. In fact, the maximum story drift reduced along the height, and in the distribution of drifts became, became almost uniform along the height. So it means that the hybrid test um, validated the design procedure and demonstrated that it led the original structure to fulfill the target response. So which are the conclusions of these research? Uh, well, first of all, we designed this design procedure uh, and we also calibrated the best uh, uh, design, sorry, drift, uh, which was equal to 60% of capacity uh, to obtain um, a reduction of the damage concentration and to have an almost uniform distribution drift demand to capacity ratio along the height. Uh, furthermore, the experimental test showed that the braces inhibited to prevent the collapse mechanism, typical of the original frame, and the braces also enhanced the dissipative capacity of the structure. In fact, they dissipated almost 50% of the input energy, but in the meantime, reduced the dissipative task of the RC members. Uh, the braces inserted in the structure uh, kept uh, the activity demand always lower than their capacity. So the design procedure um, demonstrated um, to be um, equally effective in improving the seismic response of all our case studies, even though they suffered from different uh, 
uh, levels of structure inadequacies. And even if the near collapse limit state was the target, the significant damage limit state was fulfilled, which means that the design procedure uh, attained a multi performance uh, um, target. And these considerations were all uh, validated by the hybrid test that confirmed that the upgrading, in upgrading intervention does uh, size it. Um, led to an RC frame that achieved the target limit state. So um, from this uh, presentation, these contents, we can also try to draw uh, further ideas. So which could be further developments for this design procedure? Well, the design procedure potentially could be applied for the design of seismic retrofit using any dissipative devices. Of course, it has to be properly modified to uh, determine the design parameters that are required for that special de device. But uh, the main structure of the procedure uh, can be kept uh, um, the same. And we are currently working on extending this procedure for upgrading using friction dampers. But the same design procedure uh, can be also used for an alternative retrofit intervention, introducing an external steel exoskeleton equipped with the BRPs. And uh, we are currently working on also this goal to update the procedure for this uh, uh, different type of seismic upgrading that of course can have advantages uh, compared to the previous one. Um, so this was my presentation. I hope I was in time. Um, thank you for your kind attention. Thank you very much, Francesca, for this really nice presentation. Uh, also very clear and also very interesting about a topic that is not so much investigated and is also really innovative, especially in Italy, where we don't see uh, so many kind of this kind of application in, uh, in the practice, especially. So um, now it's time for the question. So we will have a, a Q and A session. So I ask to all the people in the, um, uh, at, that are attending the webinar to uh, write the question in the chat. I expect a lot of questions because I see several people that works on this field. So. Um, uh, meanwhile, I will start with the discussion. So, uh, first of all, I'd like to ask you um, if you think that um, there's uh, the need of other kind of intervention to consider also uh, local uh, deficiencies of these existing structures, especially at the link column joints. So, if you can expect some kind of interaction with the DRBs uh, and you need to uh, locally. Uh, in yes, um, thank you for uh, the question. Yes, you're right. Actually, uh, this intervention, of course, it's quite a global kind of intervention, but we saw that it has uh, an interaction locally with the RC members, especially at the node between beam two columns. So potentially uh, there could be the need of uh, um, adding to this kind of retrofit intervention, some other local intervention to protect especially the node so, uh, of course, the design procedure works on the entire structure, but then we have also to check locally the response and in case the nodes are in need for um, to be protected, um, there can be the interaction and the integration with the local reinforcement, especially for the nodes that uh, in for existing structures are the weak points. So yes, the, your observation is absolutely correct. So um, we should keep in mind that uh, in addition to this local uh, intervention may be needed. So that has to be checked. And of course, uh, easy solutions can be found uh, to um, confine the, the node and try to avoid the local damages of the node. Perfect, thank you. We have, uh, well, we have a very long question in the chat. So I think we can read it as well. So thank you for, from Simone Labo. So thank you for the clear interest and interesting presentation. So does the introduction of BRB uh, require local strengthening of ordinary RC existing buildings? I think we can, we already answered to this part. Um, mm -hmm. 
Okay, in the case of a multi-story building, do the parameters obtained through the iterative design procedure refer to the single BRB to be introduced at each floor? Okay, so in the meantime, I was, I'm also reading on the chat the question because it was quite long. Uh, no, the, um, uh, the parameters that we suggested and we set for uh, the design are kept the same for all stories. So basically, you evaluate uh, the drift capacity at each story, of course, but always at the near collapse limit state or the significant damage limit state. It depends on what you, uh, you choose. And uh, the capacity, for example, of the braces must be selected equal at all stories. Then the, the size of the braces that comes out from the design changes may change from one story to the other one, but the design um, parameters must be kept the same at each story, so they do not change. Okay, perfect. Thank you for the for the answer and thanks also. Thank Jean. you for the question. Okay, um, let's wait for some other question in the chat. Um, okay, meanwhile, um, about the application, so in real in practice of this kind of system, especially now that in Italy we have this um, several funding for upgrading the system structure. Uh, in your opinion, which are the limitations of the technology in relation with our current knowledge and practice? In, uh... Okay, uh, well, um, it depends maybe from country to country, but um, of course, depending on the codes and the um, opportunities given by the different governments. Uh, this type of intervention, from my point of view, as a one week point, one week um, yeah, point, that's uh, the fact that uh, to introduce the braces, uh, you have to uh, demolish part, at least part, of the uh, external um, infield panel. Then, you, of course, that's a chance also of uh, changing and improving from the aesthetical point of view, the, extern the external facade. But this type of intervention, uh, it's quite uh, um, strong because it, it needs to change the external facade and uh, it requires also some demolishment. Uh, in the meantime, several other um, types of uh, interventions were developed, which can be a little bit less um, invasive because, for example, the use of the exoskeleton uh, that could be uh, an alternative because, of course, it does not require to demolish anything or to um, ask the occupants to move temporarily out from their structure. But, of course, also that technique has its own limitations because, uh, just for example, you need the space outside the structure. And uh, on the contrary, this could be an advantage for the braces inside the, um, the structure because of course uh, that's the uh, volume and the, you will not change it by introducing the braces. So there could be some limitation maybe from this point of view, but of course I think that there's not a uh, um, solution for all the problems. So we should check from uh, a case to another one, from one building to another one, which can be the best one. Of course, this is a possibility, but it has its own uh, uh, features and also limitation that has to be taken into account. That's right, I totally agree. Okay, I don't see any other questions in the chat. So, uh, okay, now another question from Simona Bianchi. Okay, th thanks for the presentation. Uh, just a curiosity, what about the residual displacement uh, of such systems? Have you considered this aspect in uh, your analysis and how this contribute to the building response? Okay, so actually uh, the residual drifts of RC frames buildings was not uh, um, in, inserted in the design procedure, but we checked and uh, the, um, the, the residual drifts were very low. And uh, actually this, uh, of course, RC frames uh, usually do not have such large uh, residual displacements compared to other types of structure, for example, um, C frames. But the insertion of the braces are, is uh, calibrated, so the features of the braces is uh, calibrated uh, in order to have uh, additional stiffness that is enough to keep the story drift almost constant along the height and to increasingly 
uh, to and to significant uh, decrease uh, the amount of drift and to keep it uh, um, almost uniform along the height. So basically, the design, the residual drift uh, were not uh, a big issue for this type of intervention and for this type of buildings. <laughs> okay, perfect. We have another question from Ludovica, but it's almost the same that you already Yeah, asked. I think it was almost the same. Okay, thank you, Ludovica, also for the question. Thank you. Okay, so. Okay, uh, I think we can, uh, um, we don't have other questions, so I think we can uh, close the webinar. So thank you very much, Francesca, for sharing. Thank you to all. And it was a pleasure. Thanks also to all, uh, all the attendees that uh, joined us today. I hope to see you in the next webinar. And see you soon. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye.